say to someone who feels like they've lost it all? Over the edge with no one there to break their fall. What do you say to someone who feels so unloved? Giving themselves away a little bit every day just to be good enough. And what do you say to a hopeless soul who can't remember their way home and everything? Jesus, there is no moment, there is no distance, there is no heartbreak, He can't take you through. So before you think you're too lost to save, remember there is nothing so very much appreciate you minding the lord <clears throat> in the song we had uh they came over the house yesterday and was singing and uh <clears throat> i'm grateful for for microphones but uh it's a whole lot louder than that in my den <laughs> and uh, they did a great great job and i appreciate that i enjoyed them being there enjoy their singing and enjoy the message i praise the lord for the message that they sung about i'm, I'm grateful for the grace of god i mean that i'm thankful that god is uh, a, a great God, but God is a gracious God, and I'm grateful that we have Him. If you know Him as your personal Savior this morning, if not, I'm grateful to be able to tell you about a God that's filled with grace. Uh, if you look at our lives and you look at where we ought to be versus the potential that He gives us where we could be, uh, it's solely by the grace of God. Uh, I'm going to have you stand just a minute. I was reading a book this week, and uh, I believe it was this week, might have been last week I was reading in the book, but... It was dealing with even, even after an individual gets saved, if we're not careful, we can, we can magnify our works and almost try to, 
try to earn keeping saved. Now, we can't do that. We're saved by the grace of God. Uh, but we'll minimize, we'll minimize grace. Now, obedience is definitely significant. Uh, that's a whole other argument. But may we never get over that we are who we are, but by the grace of the wonderful Savior, by the grace of God. Thank you, ladies, for reminding the Lord in that. Luke chapter number 24 this morning. Go ahead and stand. We're going to read one verse today. Uh, I had really, I, I had intended on being uh, a little bit further over uh, in the New Testament th this morning. We might, we might touch on that this evening, uh, maybe go hand in hand with this message, but I felt like that this is direction that God kind of steered my heart. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm grateful for Bible reading, just, just reading your Bible. Uh, you don't always have to sit down and say, okay, i got to come up with a lesson, got to come up with a message. Sometimes, uh, sometimes if we'll just read, uh, the Lord comes up with a message. It's the best kind. And I'm thankful for Scripture reading. I hope that you'll get in the Word of God. But I want to read one verse dealing with two individuals that are very, very familiar uh, if you've been studying uh, Scripture. A lot of times we'll hear this on Easter. Uh, of course, we know the surrounding of Luke 24. But I want you to draw your attention down to verse number 13. The Bible said, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem. Now I want you to, I want you to pay attention to those words. Which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. We're going to pray, ask the Lord to help in the message this morning, and uh, trust that Christ should be honored. Brother Terry, how about leading us in prayer if you would? Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated. One of the easiest things uh, I think probably for, for me to do uh, in life is, is to go the wrong way. Uh, if you know anything about, uh, me and mom were talking yesterday, if you know anything about my sense of direction, it's that it's absent from my life. I, I don't have, a, well, head north and go down two blocks and, and, and turn west. Uh, you better tell me turn by the big rock and by this tall building because I'm never, ever going to get there. Uh, it's easy, it's easy for me. Uh, in fact, so easy uh, that you, you ever had a GPS that thinks it knows where you're at as far as that little arrow, the points? Y'all know what I'm talking about on your GPS? Preacher, I don't use a GPS. Well, uh, leave the rest of us alone. And I'll follow that little arrow out of the parking lot and I'll make a right turn and all of a sudden it'll recalculate and flip me around to go the other way. Makes me so stinking mad I can't see straight. I, I mean, I, it's easy for me just to go the wrong direction. But I think more importantly than a, than a practical setting, it's also very easy for me to go the wrong direction if I'm not careful and go the opposite of the way that I believe God wants us for us to go. And when I read this story, when I read the account of Scripture about the two on the road to Emmaus, uh, it does not immediately pop out in my mind that, man, these guys were going, or these people, could have been a husband and a wife, but these people were going out into sin. They were going into this long depth of light. That doesn't pop into my mind, but I tell you what it does. It tells me that all that was in all that was going on was in Jerusalem, and they was headed away from it. Yeah. And when I begin to think about that, I begin to think about this road in and of itself was nothing wrong necessarily with the road, but it was the direction in which they were headed on the road. So there's a couple things I want to share with you this morning. Because I believe that the winding up in the wrong destination does not happen immediately. There's a lot of times that we make, uh, we travel, we make a journey, we make a trip. Two Sundays ago, we left after the morning service and we headed to Pensacola, Florida to take our kids to camp. I can promise you this, that did not happen immediately. It was a long, long journey. We could sing when we got back, it's been a long journey, but I've been blessed. And I think about, you know, a, a trip, going to a destination takes, there's a process, it takes a duration of time. When people start down the wrong road, I'm convinced of this, it doesn't happen overnight. I don't believe it just, they just wake up and say, you know what, while I'm here, how'd I get here? No, it started by headed down the wrong road. There's a couple things I want to identify this morning. First time is important. It's important to notice the time that we're preaching about. It's important to notice the significance of that time. The Bible says this, and behold, two of them went, look at this phrase, that same day. Let's have a little Bible class this morning. Does anybody know what happened on this day? What is it? Somebody tell me. Resurrection. This is resurrection morning. 
This is, this is resurrection day rather. And the same day that they got word of the resurrection, what happened? They left and they departed. I got to thinking about the timing of that day and why that was so important. You realize this should have been a monumental morning. But instead of a monumental morning, they went through a season of monumental mourning. Weeping, mourning, brokenheartedness. And so the time is very significant. You know, it's so easy when we get discouraged and downhearted. It's so easy. Rather than stay in our course, it's so easy just to head the other direction. And the time is important. I begin to think about this. The departing, the place of departing was important. Where did they leave? They left Jerusalem. But it's not only that they leave a place, but they also left the people. They left the people of God. They left the 11. The Bible talks about that the 11 were there in Jerusalem. And there was a lot of things happening in that day. But it's amazing to me that they separated from the very core group. Now, I believe this was a dangerous time for Christians. I believe that. I believe that it, it was a very uh, time that was filled with turmoil. I mean, they had just watched their Savior crucified. Uh, they had just heard him shout out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They had isolated themselves from uh, those Pharisees and those religious rulers because it was a dangerous time. And I get all of those things, but yet instead of staying with those that was of like mind and like faith, they begin to break off and they begin to wander down the road to Emmaus. So I begin to think about the place they left. I begin to think about uh, where, they, where those two was returning to. They was going back home. They were going back home. Now this is going to pop up here in just a little while, so I don't want to say much about this, but I will say this. They were headed back to the place that they had originally left in order to follow Jesus. There's a significance in that. There's a significance in going back to the place in which you came out of in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We've been talking on Wednesdays and up to just a few weeks or just a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we've been talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ. And he tells them, listen, to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. They left those places much as, that, much as Abraham did that we learned about in Sunday school when God called him out of Ur, the county. God, he left that place in order to follow God. And so you find these two returning back to presumably home rather than being where God and the people of God really were. Now, none of these things is going to help them accomplish their calling. For all intents and purposes, they were headed down the wrong road. Listen, while this road as of yet may not have been a road of sin, it was leading them to a life of such for no other reason. It's going to take them out of the will of God. They're getting ready to get their instruction. They're getting ready to get their life course. And yet they lead. Now, these were not part of the 11, Okay. But it doesn't mean that they were any less disciples of Christ. It doesn't mean that they were any less followers, that they were any less committed to the things of God. And yet they find themselves on a path, on a road that's taking them away. I'd say this, maybe all is going all right now. But if you take an honest look at your life, and I, I believe, listen, I believe it would do, do, do well for all of us every now and again to take a little inventory. You know, we're, we're probably... Now, I'm preaching to me, so y'all can take it or leave it. But we're probably not as far along as we think we are. We probably all got areas in our life that's taken us out of the course that where God would intend for us to be. And so I would encourage all of us to take a good look or a good gauge as to where we're at. You know, we aren't where we used to be, maybe. Now, I'll say this, that's not always a good gauge. Well, I ain't where I used to be, so everything's okay. No, but are you where you're supposed to be? You see, we're supposed to be growing continually. We're supposed to be increasing. I thought about, what about Peter? Let's, let's give this and I'll, and I'll move. In the life of Peter, if you remember Peter, that Peter denied Christ three times prior to the crucifixion. Now, Peter wept bitterly. Peter got right with God, and you find him assembled with the 11. Even in Luke 24, you find him assembled with the 11. But I'm grateful that Peter didn't say, okay, well, I'm where I used to be. I'm back to where I used to be. Because if you go on through the book of Acts, you're going to see a far more mature Peter than you are back but even after his repentance. You see, we're supposed to have a season of growth. So I'd ask you this question. Are you really growing in the Lord? Are you making progress down the right road or are you headed the wrong way? You see, it's usually 
headed down the wrong road is usually not something like reading road signs that scream wrong way. And I'll be honest with you, I, uh, I, I've been, I've, I've merged onto the highway before. Y'all seen them big red signs that says wrong way? You ever thought you went down the wrong one of them? Now you talk about puckered up and paying attention. Right, man, am I in, and you start looking around that curve because it's always one of them loops. <laughs> Wrong way. It's, not, it's usually not that. It's usually more like here in the GPS trying to reroute you. That stupid thing don't know where I'm at. I'm just going to keep going this route because I know more than it knows. If we're not careful when we hear instruction along this matter, we get that same mindset. They don't really know what they're talking about. I'm good. They don't really know what, what's, what's important. I'm okay in the direction I'm going. I want us to look at some things this morning and I get you to ask yourself an honest question. What road are you headed on? I know it's a Sunday morning. I'm fully aware of it's a Sunday morning. I know, I know what, what day it is. It is the Lord's day. and I know what we've heard sung. We've heard sung about grace. We've, we've heard sung, sung about the goodness of God. But I want, to, I want to encourage you this morning to ask yourself the question, am I headed the right way? Now, a couple of things I want us to look at. There's no doubt these guys were headed away from Jerusalem. No doubt. Can't argue it. You can't say, well, preacher, they really wouldn't. No, they were, they were headed away from Jerusalem on probably the most important day of Christianity. Think about it. On the most important day, I mean, we, have every, we are everything that we profess to be because of the resurrection. Everything. We're assembled here this morning on a Sunday morning because of the resurrection. The significance even of the very day in which we worship is because of the resurrection. But yet we find that on that same day when they ought to have been with the 11, when they ought to have been celebrating the resurrection, we find that they decided, hey, I think I'm going to make a trip and that trip is leading them away from where I believe they should have been. Let me give you a couple things this morning. First of all, look at the cause of their departure. Why did they leave? Why'd they leave? I've been in situations in my life and, and I had it a whole lot better than what I thought. And I thought, man, why, why'd I leave? There's been some of this in this building that have, that have left good jobs because you got a little disgruntled and you look back a few years later and you work in a far worse job getting paid less thinking, man, why'd I ever leave? I'd been much better off if I'd have just stayed. So what was the cause of their departure? Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you this and I, I want to say this. I'm not negating the significance of what they were going through. And so before we go any further in the message, I want to tell you this, this this morning. I don't know your life. I don't know your struggles. I don't know the difficulties that you've encountered. I, I just don't know that. And so I'm not standing up here with a pious attitude that I, I, that I pretend to know the experiences that you've had. But you know. And the Holy Ghost knows. The only thing I'm asking you to do is asking you to, to look within yourself and ask yourself an honest question. Am I headed on the right path? The cause of their departure, they left Jerusalem. We've already shown the evidence of their departure. We've already shown why they left and some things that we can recognize, if not recognizing the time. The significance of the time of the resurrection, the importance that this is the beginning of the rest of, of, of what we would call Christianity. This is where it started. It wasn't the end as they saw it, but it was the beginning. They didn't recognize the time leaving the assembly of believers. You'll know what road you're on. Look and see where you are with the assembly. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, Hebrews 10 teaches us. They were headed back to the place, the lifestyles, the activities in which they were delivered from. That was an easier life. I can promise you this. Man, they were familiar with that life. There wasn't the pressure of that life. Uh, there wasn't the conflict. There wasn't the conflict of having to tell their family, oh, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. I've left Judaism. I've walked away from my heritage all because I'm following this man by the name of Jesus. I'm sure that it caused conflict. I'm sure that it caused difficulties. And so they were headed back to a place of less, less opposition. No doubt there are other things, but these are evidence in the lives of these two. So what caused them to depart? Number one, verse 17, Jesus acknowledges the fact they were sad. They were sad. Sorrow is a great motivator, but oftentimes for the wrong things. Think about how we're impacted by sorrow. 
Think, think about how sorrow permeates the very essence of who we are. You ever been broken hearted? I mean genuinely broken hearted. Man, sorrow can, sorrow can skew our vision. Not, not only through, it's hard to see through tears, but if you understand, have you ever tried to see clearly through tears? Have you ever tried to just be driving down the road and all of a sudden you're heartbroken and your eyes begin to well up with tears and you begin to sob and if you wear glasses, sometimes the, the tears get on your glasses and you can't see and you're trying to wipe the tears out of your eyes because it's, I'm telling you, sorrow can cloud your vision. The Bible says here in verse number 17, and Jesus said, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Man, I like to take, take a time out for just a minute and say, aren't you glad that Jesus can recognize when we're brokenhearted? Aren't you thankful this morning? If you're saved by the grace of God, you may have seasons of sadness and you may have seasons of despair, but I'm grateful that there's a God in heaven, there's a Savior that loves you so much that can recognize your brokenheartedness. Man, they were sad. He could tell by their countenance and by their conversation. Now others could probably pick up on it as well. I remember the story in the Old Testament about the one by the name of Naomi. And you know, she said, call me Mara. They could tell outwardly, man, the sorrow of her heart. She was broken. These, these two individuals were broken. Their world had changed in literally three days. Man, they were, they were sorrowful about all the things that had happened. The events of the last three days, verses 18 through 20. Matter of fact, if you, if you listen to their tone and how they ask Jesus, how they answer Jesus, there's almost contempt in their voice. Where have you been? Now think about it. They're talking to the very one that they're mourning that he died. Now he's arisen. Now he's talking with them. And they, he makes this statement, where have you been the last three days? Man, all of Jerusalem knows. By the way, he picked up in his, in his conversation with them pretty early in their journey. He said, where have you been? I mean, you're leaving Jerusalem. Haven't you heard? And so there's almost a contempt in their voice because they were blinded as to who they were speaking with. I believe not only were they sad, but I believe that they went through a stage in their life where they felt hopeless. Where they felt hopeless. But Jason talked about that this morning. How do you know that? You, what, what makes you think that they were hopeless. Well, verse number 20 said, How the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted. We trust. We thought it was him. We, we banked everything on the fact that he's Messiah. We, we, we left our families. We left our lands. We left our houses. We left our jobs. We followed him. We traveled with him. We, we, we thought it was him. And now he's dead and now he's gone. Man, it's just like their whole world was just all of a sudden... Hopeless. There's a lot of people who go through despair and hopelessness that decide, you know what? Instead of going the right direction or back to God, they'll, they'll, they'll find themselves going down the wrong path. And they'll find themselves going down the wrong road. They couldn't see the big picture. Man, this is, now my, my, this is easy to fall into. We can't always see what God's doing behind the scenes, can we? Man, that's That's, that's tough. I'm just going to be honest with you, it's tough. We, we can stand up here and talk about, well, the just shall live by faith, and we ought to. But I'm going to tell you, when we're, in those, when we're in the darkest hours of our life, and we're in the depths of sorrow, and a place of despair, and a place of utter hopelessness, may we see, sometimes it's hard to see the big picture of what God's, God's doing. You know, we know that all things work together, but Jason, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But I sure can't see any good coming out of this. How can any good come out of the one that professed to be Messiah, that he died? How can any good come after the one that raised the, the dead and healed the sick and caused the lame to walk and the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak and the blind to see? Well, how can any good at all come out of this? How can any good come out of the church being locked up in an upper room for fear of their life? How can anything good come out of this situation? You see, they couldn't see the big picture. They couldn't see the big picture. I wonder, I wonder if they felt hurt. Honestly, I wonder if they felt hurt. I wonder if they felt slighted. I left everything. How could God do this to me? If you're honest with yourself, we've probably all been there. We might not say it out loud. How could God let me go through this? God, I left everything that I have for you. I left houses. I left lands. I said goodbye to my loved ones. God, and now how could you bring us to this point? See, they couldn't see the big picture. 
Again, there might have been other things, but I'm going to tell you, out of this, you got, I've got scripture for these things. And so they left. They departed and said, you know what? It's resurrection morning. It's resurrection day. By the way, Jesus had told them what was going to happen. And yet somewhere along the line, man, the big picture got clouded. And they decide, I'm going back home. I'm going to wash my hands of it. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to live the rest of my days and I'm going to enjoy what I can. But I'm going home. They were headed down the wrong road. Number two, not only the cause of their departure, but look at the intervention that they needed. They need an intervention. Now you say, preacher, you, I know, you, you know already where I'm going. They needed a divine intervention. You know, they needed an intervention as big as the intervention that it had when they first met Jesus. If you're here this morning, or we've mentioned a lot about being saved, but you don't know 100% you're saved, let me tell you what you need. You need this morning a divine intervention of a holy God in your life. You are, you are walking in your sin and your trespasses. You are dead uh, without Christ. You are headed to a place called hell. It's an awful place. And no matter how many good works that you may do, no matter how many church services you may attend, no matter how many times you might be run through baptismal waters, no matter of all the, the, the good you can do and charity you can do, the only thing that's going to save your soul is a divine intervention of the Savior of this world. Amen. That's the only thing. Listen, you, you don't need a preacher to talk at you. You don't need a, a Sunday school teacher to preach to you. You need a divine intervention of God. Amen. Let me tell you, you you're, in a, you're in a place that I'm, I, listen, the gospel message is still just as real as it was on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Man, the gospel's just as powerful to transform your life. There are those of us in here who have experienced that divine intervention. We know what it was like to be able to say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see. You say, preacher, uh, you're talking about people that have, have kind of gotten away from God and discouraged. I didn't say we were perfect. I didn't say we had everything figured out, but I am telling you this. We had had a divine intervention of a holy God because Jesus came to a place called Calvary. There's a story to tell. There's a Savior to preach. There's a salvation to enjoy. And I'm grateful this morning to be able to tell you that there's a God that loves you in spite of yourself and sent his son to go to Calvary. And if you'll put your faith in him, you can be saved this morning. Man, a divine intervention. What a powerful thing. Those of you that are saved, you can think about that day whenever Jesus intervened in your life and you put your faith in him. That was a big day. That's a big thing. What a change. What a difference. And I'm going to tell you, they needed the same kind of intervention. Now, they didn't need a saving intervention. They needed a salvaging intervention. They didn't need to get saved again. By the way, for, for, those, for those of us normal folk, Aren't you glad we don't have to get saved again when we fall? Yeah. Aren't you glad that when we go astray and wander down the wrong road, I don't have to come back to God and, and beg God to save my soul? Listen, I'm sealed unto the day of redemption, and I'm grateful for that. But there might be some times that i got to come and ask God, God, I need you to intervene in my life. I've gotten wayward. I went astray, and God, I don't know how to get back. And I'm grateful for this divine intervention. They needed a divine intervention Listen, it's going to take more than the Cokes and the Eleven to get them back. May I, may I be ever mindful of that? I wonder what the Eleven said. Now, there's some things we don't know. I don't know what the Eleven said when they got ready. They might have been so tore up. They didn't know who come and who went. I, I don't know. But it could have been. They might have said, oh, listen, don't leave. Let's see this thing through. Don't leave just yet. Just stay with It's dangerous out there. There's problems that's going around. Don't leave just yet. Just hang around. Just wait. Just wait. But whatever it was, none of that was good enough because they left. Let me tell you something. It's going to make, take more than a preacher preaching. It's going to take more than a, uh, than, a, than a saint of God hollering. Let me tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take a divine intervention from God to take people who are headed down the wrong path and to turn them to get back on the right road. You say, well, what was the intervention? Well, there's some things that Jesus did. By the way, I'm grateful that Jesus still does some things. I'm grateful that Jesus is still with us along the way. First of all, Jesus traveled with them. Verse number 15 says, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, they're trying to figure everything out. I believe that. I believe they were talking through everything. I believe they were trying to put the pieces together in their sadness and brokenness. I, it might have sounded something like, I can't believe what just happened. 
Man, I can't believe our, our life as we know it is over. And, and how are we going to go back and face our loved ones? We're going to have to be ashamed that we made the wrong decision and whatever it might have been. Boy, I believe they felt by themselves walking down that road. The Bible tells us that it came to pass while they communed with, together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Can I tell you, Jesus traveled with them. They were not alone, even though they didn't even realize he was around. Listen, I'm glad to report that if you're a saved child of God, you're never alone, even when you don't sense his presence around. Listen, that doesn't mean he condoned them. What's he going to do? He's going to get them back where they need to be. Listen, it doesn't mean when I get out of the will of God that God condones it, but I'm grateful that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'm glad that there's always hope as long as there's Jesus. I'm thankful there's always restoration as long as there's Christ. And I'm telling you this morning, he traveled with him. You understand today was a busy day for Jesus. Pretty big day. Now, I'm not making light of it, but I'm telling you, he had, a, he had a full agenda before he ascended back to his father. He had places to go and people to see. Don't, don't miss that. This is so important. You know, we only know one of these people's names, one of them. And he's only mentioned one time in your Bible. Yet on resurrection morning, well, this is helping. On resurrection morning, Jesus took notice of two seemingly insignificant people that nobody else may have even known their name all through the ages of eternity. We'll uh, listen up until Jesus comes. We'll only have the privilege of knowing one of these men's name. But I want you to know something. Jesus knew both. Jesus met with them. He took time out of his busy schedule to meet with them right where they were. And I'm grateful today that no matter where you're at in this journey, there's a God in heaven that knows just exactly where you're at. And he's concerned about the direction that you're headed. He wasn't too busy to meet their need. Jesus walked with them for a little while, allowed them to continue down the road. Listen, I, I'm not, you say, well, preacher, he must be okay with it. I've been headed this way for a while. No, not necessarily. Sometimes he gives us some space. Sometimes he gets, we're, we're free moral agents, my friend. You're not a puppet on a string that God is making do one thing or another. You have the, you have the freedom to choose what you'll do with Jesus Christ. Once you get saved, you have the freedom to choose how you obey that same Jesus. He allowed them to walk in that direction just because of that. It doesn't mean they're on the right road. Number two, not only Jesus traveled with them, Jesus talked with them. But more so than just talking with them, I like this, Jesus listened to them. Do you realize that Jesus took time to allow them to pour their heart out to him? Now think about it. He, Jesus said, well, no, I... What happened? Tell me what happened. He's the very one that hung on the cross. You understand that, right? And as they're in their sadness and they're trying to figure everything out and put the pieces together, Jesus just takes a moment and lets them pour their heart out to him. Sounds kind of like casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. See, preacher, you don't understand. I I've been through things that nobody in this room knows or appreciates or even can understand. And you, you might be 100% right, but can I tell you, won't you just take it to him and pour your heart out to him and find out he'll listen. He'll listen. He'll listen. Now, I'm grateful he's not going to leave you there. He's going to counsel you. He's going to draw you back. But he will listen. And he'll listen when nobody else will. He'll pay attention when nobody else will pay attention. Man, they told him all that just took place. You know what, what, what I'd have done? I'd have cut them off. I know all that. Who do you think you're talking to? You wasn't hanging on the cross. I was. You wasn't standing in that in, that, in Pilate's hall and, and being mocked and scourged and uh, having that crown. Of, you wasn't even there. You fled. You ran. And here you are all weepy about what happened. No, he didn't do none of that. You know what he did? He just listened to hurting people who were on the wrong road. If you're here this morning, I want you to know this. If you're on the wrong road, Jesus listens to hurting people even when they're headed on the wrong road. Something else I believe Jesus did, Jesus taught them. He taught them. Look down at verse number 25. Now, now, now don't miss this. Don't miss this. Jesus didn't coddle them. He taught them. What, what kind of people were these? Somebody remind me. Were they disciples? Were they followers of Christ? 
Were they pupils of the master? Yes, they were. And Jesus did not patronize them by patting them on the head and saying, it's okay. Jesus had expectations for his disciples because he had a purpose for their life. And they were not going to fill that purpose in Emmaus. And so therefore Jesus with compassion also issued a rebuke. Listen, listen to me this morning. If you're saved, and I keep reiterating that, if you're saved this morning, Jesus has a purpose for your life and he, he anticipates and he expects for us to be mature enough to listen and heed to his truth. Notice what he said. Then said he unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Those are, those are tough words. O fools and slow of heart. How did he teach him? First of all, he used his word. Can I tell you something? All the harping in the world is not going to change people, but the word will change people. Man, when we see it and we see what Christ, and, and I'm not taking a lot, I just want you to get you to examine where you're at this morning. But when you look in the, in the, in the looking glass, of, as the book of James talks about, into the perfect law of liberty, into the word of God, that book will change us if we'll give it an honest look and compare ourselves to it. And so he uses his word. What's he do? He goes back to, ought Christ not to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He said, listen, all that the prophets have taught you, they, they've told you this. Why are you, why are you so slow of heart? Why are, you, why are you being so foolish? Why are you acting unlearned? The, this is no secret that Christ had to suffer. Man, Isaiah 53 tells us he had to suffer. And he said, listen, there's, there's a rebuke that was issued. Let me give you the third thing. Because he didn't leave them there. You realize that this encounter with Jesus changed them? It changed them. There's no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It changed them. This encounter with Jesus changed their direction. Make no mistake, listen, they would need nothing less than a reviving to get them back to Jerusalem. A reviving. We, we talk about revival, and I, uh, I, I thought about this. What happened in their life is that fire had dwindled. That, that zeal in their heart that they had once they, when they first made that decision, I'm going to follow him. Man, that sell all and leave, take up my cross and follow him. There's a burning in their soul, and that had, had left them at this point. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. They were not unsaved, unbelieving people. These were people who professed to know Jesus as their Savior. They were disciples of him. They had answered the call to follow me. They had assembled with the other disciples more than likely for the last three days. They had, up to this point, picked up their crosses and followed him. But they were sad and they were disheartened and they were disengaging from the brethren. And now they had departed and headed down the wrong road. They needed a reviving. I wrote this down. They needed more than a peppy song, a flowery message, and a three-day emotional high. Did you hear what I said? They needed more than a peppy song, a flowery message, and a three-day emotional high. A lot of times what we call revival is just that. I'm for it. I, listen, I, I'm, for, I'm for good singing. I'm for good preaching. I, I like, I, I'm glad we have emotion. I really am. I'm glad we have emotion. But a real reviving is going, is going to take more. It, it runs deeper than those three things. It runs deeper. Why? A real reviving will change how we walk. It'll change how we think. It'll change how we operate. You know what they needed? They needed a genuine reviving of their soul. Verse 28 down through verse number 35 is all about their trip back. Take some time. Get in it. Read it when you get home. But there were some significant events that led them back to where? Back to Jerusalem, back to where they left. Back to where they left. First of all, what was the first event? The influence of the conversation with Jesus. It always makes a difference when we talk with Jesus. Always. It'll always make it. You say, well, preacher, sometimes I pray and it feels like God is a million miles away. Don't stop praying. Man, not, don't stop conversing. Don't stop telling him. If you're a child of God, just don't stop. It always makes a difference. Jesus is listening and he cares. Notice this in verse 31 and 32. 
And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Then after they began to put the pieces together, listen to what they said. You've heard a lot of preaching on this, no doubt. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he what? While he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. That word burn has an indication of to set something afire. To set something afire. You know what they said? They said, man, we left Jerusalem and we were downhearted. We were discouraged. We were in despair. We were distraught. We had got to the place of hopelessness. We were sad. But while we talked with him, the more we talked, there was something welling up on the inside of us. There was something that seemed like it was just setting us on fire. There was something that hope welled back up. There was, there was just something about that conversation. They were greatly moved. He used rebuke, he used scripture. Second of all, the power of fellowship. The power of fellowship. There is something to do with fellowship and with God. Our, our, several of our fellows have, have volunteered. They said they want to be part of a text group. And, and so we try to share a little devotional. If you're not part of that you'd like to be, let me know. And nothing profound. Some days, some days nobody shares. Some days you know, a person does. But you know, I, I enjoy what, what everybody has to say. But I'm going to tell you something. Somebody else's devotions are no substitute for mine. Somebody else's fellowship is no, no substitute for me getting in the Word of God and having fellowship personally with my Savior. Man, I can sit and I can read. It takes, it takes about two minutes to read. And you sit there and read and you can say, man, that's a good thought. That's a good thought. And some people will comment, amen, or whatever. And I'm going to tell you, that doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't take the place of my personal fellowship with God. My personal walk. Let me say you, the, the, the power of fellowship, I like this, they were hospitable, not hostile. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Back in 28 through 31, you know what the Bible says? As they got there, they had reached their destination, the farthest point away from the road that God wanted them on, they got there. The Bible said that Jesus acted like he's going to go a little farther, and they stopped, and they wanted him to come in. They wanted him to, to, to share their home and to share a meal and, and the hospitality was a big thing in that culture. But as he got there, they was hospitable. Let me ask you a question. How hospitable would you have been to a man that called you a foolish uh, and slow of heart? I'd probably been like, man, see you. Got inside and been like, who's that dude think he was? Now come on, be honest with you. You know, sometimes we get resentful when somebody comes and preaches the truth even if they preach it out of love. Man, they don't know my situation. Who do they think they are? I didn't need that. That was for somebody. On and on and on you can go. But had they been that way, they would have missed out on fellowship. As they sat and, they bro and Jesus broke bread. Can you imagine as they heard him pray? He broke bread. They'd seen him do that before. They'd watched him break bread before. They'd heard him talk to his father before. I wonder if something in their mind clicked and said, Man, this looks awful familiar. I, man, I, 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 I've, I've seen those hands before. I, something, something familiar about that. I, I've heard that tone before. You see, they wouldn't have got that had it not been for fellowship. Can I ask you a question this morning? How's your fellowship with the Lord? I talked to you about your salvation before, but how's your fellowship with the Lord? You see, without that vital fellowship, I'm afraid it's so easy to walk down the wrong path. But if we'll have that fellowship, God knows how to take us from that road back to the road that he has for us to be on. They fellowshiped with him as during this time their eyes were open, the significance of their return. Look at verse number 33 and I'm done. And they rose up the same hour and returned, where does that say? To Jerusalem. They went back to the place that they had just come from. I don't know how, how tired they were, but I can promise you this. I think they made better time getting back there than they did getting away from there. I think they made better time. I, how many of you like to get home? Like to get home. We left for camp. We drove, we drove halfway to camp. I didn't have to drive the van, hallelujah. I was in my truck. My cold seats on. Radio playing and nobody screaming, talking. I mean, we just, except Libby. And uh, 
Man, we's driving and we just ease down and we, we come through Atlanta. Atlanta's a wonderful place to help your fellowship with the Lord. And we drove through Atlanta and we went to Opelika. And we got to Opelika or Opelika, it depends on where you're from. And we got down there and we went, got, got in the hotel and we just rested. And we was going to come in and have an easy day to go in the next day. And let me tell you something. When we left out Friday morning, we come home, Jack. And had it not been for a few unforeseen pit stops we had to make. <coughs> By the way, I don't make near as good time with y'all as I do when you ain't there. That's free. But I wanted to be home. I mean, I wanted to be home. And now we had to go all the way around Tennessee to get home. After we made fun of Savannah dropping her off, we was almost there. But man, I was ready to get home. And generally, just about any time I go to Florida, I make much better time on my way home than I do on my way there. You say, why is that? Because I'm ready to be home. There was something in there that happened that clicked in their brain that said, man, I got to get back and I got to tell them. I got to get back. I got to tell them. Now I, don't, now, I don't know if they jogged, ran, took a camel or a caravan. I have no idea, but I know this. I know they got back in the same day. That same day, they begin to leave. And they, they headed out and they returned. Number one, they returned to the 11. They returned to that crowd that they just left. Your crowd says a lot about your location. My, my, my actions say a lot about my location. But they returned to that crowd. But I, I like this. Man, they returned with a, with a restored zeal. You say, what do you mean? Look down at verse number 34. What did they go back saying? Oh, sorry, sorry we left. Would y'all would y'all forgive us? Listen, it wasn't about it was about them and Jesus. Are you hearing me this morning? Uh, it's not about coming and saving face before somebody. It's about getting things right with Christ. And when you get things right with Christ, you can come back and you can approach the leaven knowing, hey, listen, I've seen Jesus. He's made the difference in my life. Uh, it was almost to me like this. Y'all ain't gonna believe this. Now, how could he say? Because they didn't believe it when those women told him. Man, they's a bunch of carnal disciples too. But listen, they were now convinced because of the change that happened in their life. The saying, the Lord is risen. But look at this word, indeed. It's true. And them women weren't crazy. It's true. They were right. Listen, he showed himself to Peter. Look, they were right. It's true. He's alive. He's risen. Just like he said. Now, from the moment that they saw him, let me give you something to think about. All that had transpired that caused them to leave, whatever it might have been, sadness, discouragement, despair. When they, when they walked away, they had somewhat with their life walked away from follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Oh, I'm going to follow you wherever. Yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Then Calvary takes place. Then all of a sudden it's like, who do we have to follow? And so they go back home. I believe from the moment that Jesus opened their eyes, took the, the veil off of their eyes, from that very moment, I believe every bit of that follow me was restored in their life. I believe they reached down, picked up their cross one more time and decided I'm going to give my life for him just like I said. He's alive all is well. I believe there was a renewed zeal about the purpose of their life. And I'll tell you this, there can, there can be in my life and there can be in your life. From the outset of the message, I ask you, if you take an honest look at the road that you're headed on. That you take an honest look, not, not for me, but for you, for you, Savior. Number one, if you're here this morning and you don't know this Savior that I've been preaching about, you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. One who'll go with you even in your faults and even in your failures. One who'll never forsake you and never let you know. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, would you come this morning and allow somebody to take their Bible and show you how you can be saved? Just show you, you can know, have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You can do it this morning by faith, by faith. If you're here this morning, you say, Preacher, I'm afraid that I may be headed down the wrong road. Oh, you, you might not be very far. Maybe you're along. I don't know. You're taking the look, not me. But whatever the case might be this morning, would you find yourself on an altar and just do business with God today? Would you stand? Let me, let me say this this morning. Don't come for me. Don't, don't come for me, but come. If God has dealt with your heart about anything, would you come this morning? Maybe it's to pray. 
Maybe it's to pray for someone that you're afraid is. They're just lost. They don't know Christ their Savior. The altar's open. You can come pray for them. Maybe it's to pray for that one who may have wandered or may have strayed. You just want to come pray for them. Whatever the need might be this morning, would you slip out right where you're at? Find yourself at an altar and just do business with the Lord. It's not about fitting in with the bread. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about being on the road that God wants you to be on. Having the courage to look and say, man, I've strayed, I've wandered. I bet they took the same road back as they took that way. Say, preacher, I, 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 I kind of know where I went wrong. Take the same road back and go back to where you need to be. The invitation is a serious time. I believe that. It's not a time for talking. It's not a time for laughter. It's not a time to discuss things. It's a time when you do personal business just with you and God.